I think we're ready to roll. So um, we're in for a great treat today. Uh, we've got Antonia Hyman from uh, Wattel Lipton and uh, her partner, uh, Sebastian Nile. Sebastian will be joining us in a bit. We're going to be talking about joint ventures today, and I want to thank, particularly I want to thank uh, Antonia and Sebastian for their hard work on this with, uh, with our hardworking student, Alexis. So Alexis, let me turn it over to you. Um, hi, so quick introduction. Um, shall I introduce Sebastian now? Or why don't we introduce Sebastian a little bit later when he's actually going to join? <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so introduction of Ms. Hyman. She is an associate at Watchel Lipton Rosin and Cats. She got her BA at Princeton, an MBA at Columbia Business, and her JD at Columbia Law. So lots of degrees at very prestigious universities. Thanks, Alexis. I think what that means is that I, I just really like school more than anything else. Um, I'm really happy to be here today with, with all of you. One thing Alexis didn't mention is that I graduated in 2018, so I've been practicing for about three years. Um, but more, more than that, I, I vividly remember what it's like to be a student. Um, it wasn't that long ago. So hopefully we can um, discuss the materials and concepts in a very um, you know, easy, easy to digest manner. Um, one thing Alexis did, which was incredibly helpful was she actually put together a presentation with all of the reading notes, um, which I think you have each received. Um, but before I guess we tick through the notes, I think it would be helpful to give you a little bit of context, right? So before we actually dive into the provisions, let's talk about what happens, you know, when someone actually does want to go and raise money. Um, so to start, the cast of players, the entrepreneur obviously is going to be one of the most, uh, if not the most essential person. Um, and this is the person who, you know, has the idea or has been working on the business and they need to raise money um, for a variety of reasons, whether, you know, they're going to build the product or whether they're going to expand the reach um, or they want to hire additional people. Um, the next kind of group of of uh, people are the, the VCs, the venture capitalists. Um, and there are lots of different types of, of VCs. Um, they kind of range from based on the stage. So at the earliest, you might have your, your angel investors. And these are really um, individuals who might you know, write you a 10 or $15,000 check. And that's frequently what people refer to as you know, the friends and family money. Um, VCs themselves tend to be more institutionalized. They have limited partners who actually provide the funds and then the general partners who, who manage the funds. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, they come in many different shapes, sizes, experience levels. Um, and many are going to be industry or category focused. So a lot of VCs now are very focused on health tech um, given COVID. And so they might look for for companies that are, are um, building a product or offering a service in, in that field. Um, and so at the VCs, you'll have your managing partner, your partners, air quotes, because they're, they're not technically partners. Um, these are the folks who are um, the deal professionals. Um, and they often help with, you know, reviewing the deals, they don't usually have decision making authority or power, but um, they help uh, the funnel. That is, you know, when someone reaches out about a deal, these are the kind of mid level people that are going to look at it. Underneath them, you have your associates and analysts. Um, sometimes you might have just the associate, sometimes you might just have the analysts. These are the folks who are, you know, writing the investment memos, playing around with the model. Um, they might also be the folks who are actually looking for deals, right? So looking for opportunities where the VC might want to invest. So up and down the totem pole, it's really important to know who you're talking to when you're first trying to raise money or who you're potentially negotiating with because you want to make sure that the person you're 
dealing with has, has real negotiating power. And that's unfortunately usually not gonna be the analyst who's right out of college. Antonio, can I ask you a question? Yes. Can you elaborate for just a bit on the structure of a VC firm? Are they likely to be organized as a limited partnership? Um, um, and uh, who are likely to be the general partners in a, in a, v, in a VC or the, the, yeah, the that's managers? Yeah, that's a good question. And we'll touch on this more later, but to get to your question, yes, they're usually they are usually organized as limited partnerships. And that what this means is that they'll have people who invest in them as, as LPs, right? And these LPs can be um, institutions, depending if it's a VC that's been around for a while. Um, they can be family offices. So for example, um, for the mega wealthy, they'll have a fund that actually you know, manages their money. So, so one of those funds might be an investor in the VC. Um, they can also, when they're first starting off, will look to raise their friends and family rounds uh, from, albeit larger sources of capital, but people they know in their networks as well. The GP, the general partner, is more of the day-to-day -day operator of the fund. This is going to be the person who has the decision-making power and who can say, this is what we're investing in. Generally, limited partners are not going to do that. They are not reviewing the deal sheets. They're more like pretty much silent partners in, in most fund structures. And GPs, um, the general partners, some are professional investors. Um, you know, others have had lots of success in the startup world themselves and have now decided to invest their own money. So it, 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 it definitely ranges. Um, and then I think you have, you know, some folks who are, were limited partners and, and, and want to go ahead and do it on their own. But it, I think the, the, the more common split is between, you know, professional finance professionals um, and uh, I would say former founders who, who have been successful. So I, th I think the next kind of group of players I would, I would focus on is the syndicate. And the syndicate um, is a collection of investors. So while certainly a VC might choose to invest alone, meaning that they give up, they provide all of the capital, you know, they decide to do the entire deal. Most of the time VCs will invest with other VCs. So the syndicate is the, the group um, that includes all of the, the VCs. And to be fair, you know, a syndicate might also include an angel investor, or it might also include a strategic investor um, or any other corporation or anyone else, frankly, um, that ends up purchasing equity in the financing. Um, and last but not least, I guess why we're all here, we have the lawyers. Um, and the lawyers, you guys, are going to help negotiate the term sheet and the various different agreements that, that come into play and are, are really, really critical, um, particularly with first-time founders um, or even second-time founders who just don't necessarily have an understanding of all the protections that they should be looking for, um, or even really how to negotiate the agreement at all. So really important here. Does that all make sense? Any questions? Okay. So the next step, you know, once you understand the kind of cast of characters, you wanna think about, all right, well, I need to raise money. The first question is, well, how much should I raise? Um, one of the things founders, you know, need to think about is rather than coming up, particularly at the early stage with a very complicated model, um, a lot of the times you'll see that founders say, I need to reach my next milestone, right? And they try to figure out how much money they need in order to hit that milestone. And they do that by figuring out one, something called their burn rate. And their burn rate is essentially the amount of money that they're going to be spending every month um, if, assuming that, you know, there are no revenues. So for example, um, you know, let's say you're starting out and it's gonna take you six months to get a product to market with a team of eight people. You know, it costs about 100K a month. Um, you know, you, you might say 600K you wanna raise. I'd likely say build in some cushion and try to go out and raise up to a million dollars from, from a VC. Once you know the amount, um, we you know, always advise clients, like you need to have your materials together. 
if a VC is interested, there's going to be an extensive diligence process, which Alexis will talk more about. Um, and you're gonna need to make sure that you have the typical kind of documentation and preparing them up front will make it so that the process can run smoothly and there are no hiccups. So that means, you know, they're gonna look for the material contracts. They're gonna look for employment agreements. Um, they might even look for board minutes, kind of the more kind of run of the mill documents. Um, so now you know how much money you wanna raise, you know the diligence materials, you have an idea. The next step is finding the right VC. So as we talked a little bit about before, there are lots of different VCs. And so as a founder, your job is, and, and also as you know, an advisor to a founder, your job is to make sure that you're reaching out to the right sort of VCs. So if you are a e-commerce company, reaching out to a biotech um, VC fund is, is probably not going to be great, right? Because they don't invest in your vertical. So we should be thinking about this, both the industry, i.e. where the fund invests and also um, the stage. Some, some uh, VCs invest only in early stage deals. Others invest in you know, mid to late stage. Um, so it's important to kind of, kind of know that. Um, as well. So, you know, assuming you're lucky enough to get a term sheet, um, I've had a couple of founders, you know, tell me that they've reached out to 75 to 100 VCs to get their first term sheet. So it certainly is a grind. Um, there are going to be certain provisions in that term sheet um, that founders and investors are going to focus on. And that is the crux of the presentation that Alexis put together, which will be very helpful. So it's not until after a VC is interested in a potential investment and has done you know, the requisite diligence, or at least a part of it, that you'll actually get offered a term sheet. Um, and the two most important concepts or things to remember when we're discussing these provisions are one, the economics, and two, control. Economics and control are what investors care about and it's what founders should be very um, guarded about as well. So the economics return, you know, refers to the return that investors will get if there is, an, if there is a liquidity event. And by liquidity event, I mean you know, a sale, an IPO, um, if they wind down the business. Um, and those terms are going to have a direct impact on the investment. Obviously, the VC cares about, you know, what the return is going to be. And something Sebastian will discuss later is how VC economics work. Um, but for your purposes, you know, right now you should assume that of the many dozens of investments that the VC makes, most of them are not going to be successful. And that's why it's important that they have at least one, two or three really, really successful high value exits. So this is, you know, above a 2x, 3x, 4x return. We're looking at 10, 20x multiples because, you know, the other investments are not going to pan out. Um, so that said, I guess before I turn it over to Alexis, one last thing I want to hit on is that not all financing stages are going to be created equally. And it's important to keep this in mind when Alexis is going through the presentation um, because it, it definitely affects the, the negotiation. So for your seed round, your seed round are, you know, is the earlier stage of financing. You might have pre-revenue, you might be pre-revenue, you might have some revenue, you might not have a profit. Um, these are usually the, the friends and family rounds that I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, and in these rounds, there's less likely to be serious diligence, right? You know, if it's your friends, your family, or people that you know, um, they might not ask for everything. Um, but one concern here is you want to be careful that you don't get a valuation that is too high, right? That you don't get investors who are saying, we think you're worth this much. Um, because at some other point, you might need to raise additional financing. And if you raise additional financing at a valuation that is lower than your seed round, those investors, you know, who took a risk and, and bet on you very early are likely going to um, get diluted. And that's something that is, you know, one of the most important kind of 
features um, and provisions that we see in term sheets, which Alexis will talk about as well. Um, early stage deals, you know, which you'll hear kind of referred to as series A, series B deals. Um, the concern here is, you know, similar to the seed rounds, but you also really have to be careful that um, you're setting the right precedent, right? So if you are um, not careful, you will get stuck with terms that are likely going to carry through to mid and late stage um, financings if that happens, right? So if you negotiate something for your Series A, you should assume that for the most part, those provisions tend to carry through. Um, and then the last thing I would say is for the mid and late stage rounds called Series C and D, um, that's where board composition and voting control starts to come into play because now you've done you know, maybe four or five or six rounds of financing and everyone wants a board seat. And so you, you might as a founder be managing um, a board that has, has multiple investors with conflicting interests. So something to keep in mind. Um, but with that, I guess, Alexis, if you could take us through the, the presentation and I'll, I'll hop in and, and definitely, you know, feel free to interrupt with any questions. We'll try to answer them. Um, sorry, I'm just getting my dual monitors all set up. Okay, so, over there. sorry, I just had to get all my monitors set up. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about venture capital finance. Um, venture capital financing class leaders. And we've already introduced our wonderful um, attorneys to help us. So first let's talk about equity securities. First equity represents an ownership interest in an issuing company. So that's kind of what equities is. It's just talking about ownership of these corporations. And we have preferred stock the stock has priority over another equity security with respect to payments of dividends or the distribution of assets on liquidation of the corporation. So preferred stock is we've talked about in other classes, they get, they get paid first. Um, and then classes, different types of stock, which can be divided further into series. So when we have so much stock, they divide it up into classes. And then if need be, they divide it further into series. Charter, document that must set forth special powers, preferences, and rights of a particular class, distinguishing one class from another and their corresponding rights. So we'll talk a little bit about charter later and what it includes, but essentially the charter needs to include everything. If you want it spelled out, the charter is what holds it all together. Preferred stuff. Um, preferred stock has special rights regarding voting and conversion into st common stock as applicable. So because they get paid first, they also have different rights than people who hold common stock. And then we have redemption rights. And just a quick overview. Redemption rights allows investors to require a company to repurchase their shares after a certain specified amount of time. And so Redemption rights must be written into the charter and they're usually written in relation to and distinction from other rights. So it's its own category. Rights in the charter must apply to all class holders. So it can't just, if it's a, if it's a right for a preferred stockholder, it has to apply to all preferred stockholders. A contractual right, however, is personable, is personal only applicable to that stockholder. So there is an option to have a right that specifically is for you only. But in, in, in can I, let me just interject here, but pre, pre, the terms of preferred stock are determined by, by contract or by the, by the, um, the charter. So 
uh, the charter will set out the specific terms um, under which the uh, that will govern the preferred stock. Are you asking me or? No, oh. I was just making it as a comment. Okay. And then we're gonna move on to dividends. Um, the definition of a dividend is a distribution by a corporation of its stock, cash, or other property on a proportionate basis to its shareholders. So essentially anything that you're using to pay your shareholders, that's what a dividend is. There are some restrictions on dividends um, restrictions are imposed by state law and should be carefully complied with. So like with anything we've dealt with in law school, there are state laws that you need to read carefully because there's always a catch or some little asterisk footnote and they need to be read carefully so that you're not in violation of any state laws. After payment of dividends, a corporation must be in a financial standing that allows it to meet other obligations as they come up. So essentially a corporation cannot be completely broke after it pays its dividends. It needs to be financially stable. And then the purpose is to protect creditors. So people who are investing, they want to make sure that they will get a return on their investments. And then dividends terminology. So we have declared dividends and that's when a board of directors of a specific corporation or company has obligated itself to pay a dividend. So they'll meet together and they say, we will pay this and now they have to pay it. It's non-discretionary. Um, and a paid dividend is when it actually gets paid. <laughs> but the date set to have a paid dividend is set at the time it's declared. So when the board meets together to declare a dividend, they set a specific date on when they're gonna pay it. And then the funds get distributed at that specific time. And then there's accrued dividends, a dividend that is declared but not paid. So you can have cumulative dividends that can be accrued without being declared. These are also non-discretionary. You are obligated to pay these but they don't have to be paid on their specified date. It's okay to pay them a little bit later. The amount just accrues and the company has to accrue funds to pay them off. Let me, let me just take a minute on, on that point. Um, can you go back to that slide, Alexis, please? So, so keep in mind that when you're structuring preferred stock, if you're, if you're doing it on behalf of the investor, uh, and the company says, well, you know, we may not have cash to pay or have earnings to pay dividends. One of the things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put into that preferred stock a, a provision that says that if the dividend is not paid, it, it, it accumulates. In other words, they're cumulative dividends. So if, you, if the dividend is 5% of the $100 that's paid for a share of preferred, uh, if that 5% doesn't get paid in a year, um, you want to make sure that it accumulates so that you will get paid it at some point, even at, uh, if necessary, at the point the company is liquidated prior to any payments to the common shareholders. Antonia, this is a very important point. Do you want to elaborate at all on this? Sure. Um, Alexis... Can you flip to the next slide, please? So um, what Professor Thompson said is, is exactly correct. And so what we've tried to do here um, is basically lay out three different flavors, we can call them, you know, in terms of how this provision would look. Now, of course, there are, you know, a lot of different approaches, but we've included three for simplicity. Sorry. Um, it Give me just go back to the dividend. Sorry. There you go. Perfect. So the difference between the economic effect of the three approaches is really a function of three points. One, it's going to be the percentage return assumed for the preferred stock. Two, as we just talked about, it's going to be whether the dividend is cumulative or non-cumulative. 
And three, um, what also matters is whether the issuance of the dividend for preferred stock takes precedent, takes preference, sorry, um, over the issuance of a dividend for the common. So, you know, just looking at the investor favorable approach, here you see that investors would get a 15% annual return. Um, and that dividend must be paid um, before any dividend is paid to common shareholders. Um, and, and as an investor, you're going to want to make sure that these dividends are cumulative. And that means that, you know, if the dividend isn't issued in year one, for whatever reason, you know, maybe there isn't enough um, cash on hand, um, or the company wants to reinvest proceeds, you want to make sure that at some point you can collect on those past dividends. Um, the more middle of the road approach, you see the rate, um, which is illustrative, but the rate here is 8%. Um, again, it needs to be paid before any dividend is paid to the, the common shareholder. Um, but note that the dividend here is not cumulative. And that's, that's a really big point. This means, again, that if a company didn't have the resources to pay for the dividend in year one, the next year the slate is clean. Um, the company isn't obligated to make good um, on the issuance of the dividends for previous years. Um, and you see the most, you know, Antonio, company. Can I just ask you a question? Yes, go have ahead. Have you ever seen a, a, an investment where there was a non-cumulative dividend? I mean, that's a that's a very fair point. It's I everything I can think of seeing has been cumulative. Like it's a very very important point for an investor. And I think there was a question um, that Brittany asked in the chat, which is you know, did I know whether I was going to focus on VC stuff when I was in school or did I do corporate law? So I'll just clarify, I should have maybe said it. I actually do more M&A work. So I am working with companies who are either private and they're going to sell themselves or they're public, but I'm usually not working with early stage companies. The reason I actually got interested in this sort of stuff is because when I was in business school, I worked at a, a venture fund and I also worked a lot with startups who are raising money. And so I actually got to see kind of firsthand um, how this stuff worked. And I thought it was, I thought it was pretty interesting. Awesome. Um, Alexis, do you want to turn to the liquidation? Can I ask you one other question about yes. cumulative, cumulative uh, preferred? Sure. Now, keep in mind when you're talking about preferred, the shareholder doesn't have a right to force the company to pay the dividend the, because um, uh, the, the, the company's board can decide whether or not to pay the dividend. So if the company's board does not pay the dividend and it's going to accumulate, have you seen situations, Antonia, where there was some type of interest rate on the non-paid dividend that's accumulating so that you, so that you get an additional amount added to it uh, to compensate for the time value of money? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't, um, but that's that I don't usually see this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. I would have to imagine that, you know, someone would have thought of something, would have thought of something like that, because to your point, you can't force the board to um, declare it. Are we ready for the next slide? Yes. Um, just a little more on preferred stock before we move to liquidation preference. Um, priority preference, some percentage of the original purchase price of the preferred stock prior to any dividend payment to the holders on stock. So that's the definition of priority preference. Then there's the when, as, and if declared clause, which you can put in the charter. And essentially that kind of gives some flexibility in the charter. So it makes things not mandatory. Um, it's and if declared. Preferred stock is essentially a supersized common stock. Preferred stock is represented by the dividend participation right when they have separate rights to share in any dividend paid on the common stock. So then we're moving on to liquidation preference. Um, like we discussed priority right a little bit. Primary purpose of liquidation preference is to allow preferred stockholders to get back their invested funds on a sale of business. 
before equity stockholders are paid any amount. So similar to preferred stock, they just wanna get their money and their investments back first. Um, so we have priority right, which is based on the original price of preferred stock. So the amount that they're gonna get back and plus accrued but unpaid dividends. And when you have participation right, you will get back an amount based on the number of common stock shares issuable upon conversion of the preferred stock. So these are for preferred stockholders. You can have priority right or participation right. Thanks, Alexis. So just taking a step back for a moment, what does liquidation mean? Liquidation means, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the end of the business. It could actually be a sale as well. Um, and so the most important variable to consider in a liquidation preference prov provision is the multiple on investment, the initial investment that prefer preferred and common shareholders will receive as a result of the liquidation event. Um, so, you know, I'll let you guys read, you know, the, the three different varieties in your off time, but generally speaking, an investor favorable position provision is going to provide the preferred holders a multiple on the value of their initial investment plus any um, unpaid and accrued dividends, right? And so this basically means that in the event of a sale or a bankruptcy, preference is going to be given to the preferred investors to receive, you know, in the case that's on the slide, three times their initial investment plus declared and unpaid dividends. Um, and that's before anything is being paid to the common shareholders. So that what, what that means in theory, you know, if the, if the company, if it's actually, let's say it's a bankruptcy is that the common shareholders are probably not going to get everything if you have to reach that three times hurdle. Um, I think the more middle of the road approach um, is that, you know, the proceeds are first distributed to prefer, preferred shareholders, um, but in a less preferential matter. Um, in, the, in this case, you know, I guess you could say the, the original purchase price is going to be covered. So, you know, preferred investors will get that back plus any declared and unpaid dividends. Um, and thereafter, right? So once they receive their initial investment back, common and preferred shareholders um, will share in the ownership position of the remaining distributions until the preferred um, has received three times the original purchase price. So in the middle of the road approach, you see that the, the common shareholders have at least a chance of, of getting something um, in the event of a bankruptcy. Um, so Sebastian will talk a little bit more about VC economics towards the, the latter half of this presentation, um, but this sort of stuff is really important for VCs. Um, and that's because, you know, it's basically because of what Professor Thompson said before, which is all about this time value of money and investors are going to be very, very sensitive to it. A return of three times, three X seems like a lot, um, but three X over you know, four years only equates to a 32% annualized return. Um, and if you think about 32% annualized return, that sounds good, but to a VC, you know, they need to knock one, two, three investments out of the park compared to the other dozens that, you know, the other dozen that don't do well, a 32% return isn't attractive at all. Are you, am I good? Yep. Uh, and uh, let, let me just ask a question, Antonia. Do you find that the multiple uh, is a function of how long the investment has been in place. So, I mean, for, for example, suppose, suppose you, you, you knock the ball out of the park, you got a blowout deal. Should the multiple be the same as it is when you have a deal that takes 10 years or some significant period to, uh, to, uh, to reach the point where, you, where, you, where you're going to have a, a, liquid, a liquidation event? Or yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was at a VC. Yeah, we absolutely consider that. And in fact, it wasn't, it was, it was, as you might expect, tied to, you know, the life of the fund. If it's a fund that's for four to seven years, and we're making our last investment in something, you know, that we don't think we're going to see a return on for a while, 
um, we might increase the multiple. Um, that said, based on my experience, which albeit is, is narrow, having just been at two funds, um, I think three times three X is, is, is pretty standard for what you ask for with a uh, early stage company. So we are going to talk about conversion rates now. So converting preferred stock to common stock. Um, conversion may take place at the option of the holder of the convertible security. So the preferred stockholder. Um, upon, occurrence, upon the occurrence of a specified event or upon a vote of shares of the class of stock having the conversion right. So as we discussed earlier, class was one subgroup of the stock. So if a vote of the shares of that class, then you get the conversion rate. Con the conversion rate is the number of shares of common stock into which one share of preferred stock is convertible. Thanks, Alexis. Um, so conversion in and of itself um, isn't necessarily considered an investor or company favorable kind of provision because when conversion happens, um, it's always assumed to, or mostly assumed to be at the event in which a preferred converts to common shares on a one-to-one -one basis. So the provisions here actually um, relate to, you know, automatic conversion, right? So a standard conversion clause is gonna say something like this. The holders of the series A preferred um, have the right to convert the series A preferred at any time, so it's at their option, into shares of common stock. The initial conversion rate shall be one-to-one -one, um, subject to any adjustment. Um, and the purpose of the clause um, is to enable preferred shareholders to convert in the event of a liquidity event like an IPO, um, or a sale that might generate a return that is higher than what the preferred investor would otherwise be entitled to. Um, so that's a really important point, right? Because we're basically acknowledging and, and, and VCs know that they will give up their preferred rights if a liquidation transaction would yield um, a very high return. Now, this doesn't happen all the time, right? Like the VC's portfolio of companies is, is gonna, you know, have some, some companies that go bankrupt um, or they exit at a modest multiple or they don't, you know, they don't IPO and, and kind of knock it out of the park. Um, but when it does happen, a preferred investor um, will, uh, will give up their rights. Um, you know, that's, that, is such a, that is such a powerful point. Uh, and one, frankly, that I, I was never aware of um, uh, prior to prior to reading this. Um, so, when you talk about the three x return, what you're saying is that the 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 preferred investor is going to be looking for that three x return, but what it would like is for the return it would receive if it converted the preferred to common would be more than the three X return that they would get from, from simply um, the, the provision of the preferred. Do I have that right? That's, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Cause as we just discussed the three X return over four years, you know, isn't super attractive. I'll take a 32% return, <laughs> but uh, for these guys, you know, they, they are looking for 10 X returns. Um, so the thing to keep in mind with these kind of varieties of the provisions, um, is that investors are going to be focused on two points. Um, one, the number of times of the original purchase price that of the preferred stock will automatically convert into common. Um, and two, the money that will qualify as an IPO, right? So in the, in the investor favorable, the number is, let's call it 40 million. Um, and those two points are getting at the fact that investors um, don't want to receive common shares that are, are thinly traded, right? Or there is not a left, enough liquidity in the stock. Because what that means is that after they get their shares, their common shares, you know, most of the time they're going to be locked up 
for some, some amount of time where they can't actually sell. But at some point, they're going to they're going to want to sell and realize, you know, uh, a return on their investment. If the stock is, is thinly traded, meaning that, you know, it was too small of an IPO and not enough investors hold it, those initial preferred investors are not going to be able to make a sale. So they're very focused on the size of the IPO. Um, and, and again, they're going to be focused on that two times or three times the original purchase price. So that as a, as a practical matter, then, um, as a practical matter, you aren't going to see a conversion unless you have a liquidity event that's producing a, a amount per common share that is greater than 3x of the uh uh, of the co of the uh, comparable uh, preferred share, so that so that the preferred is going to in essence stay outstanding until a liquidity event. Is that pretty much the case? Yes. Any questions? I don't think I saw any in the chat. Okay. Sorry, I prematurely clicked to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we'll talk about anti-dilution protection. So dilution is the effect of an increase in the number of shares of a stock a company has that's outstanding. And dilution to economic value is the adverse result that follows when the company sells new shares at a price lower than the price that was paid by preferred stockholders. So this is kind of like down round financing, which I'm about to discuss in the next point. Um, down round financing is an investment in which Pre-money valuation by the new investors is lower than the post-money valuation at the completion of the prior round of financing. So at the start of a company, you may pay X amount for your preferred stock, but then later on, they realize that the, the value of that stock is lower, so they sell at a lower price. So the current preferred stockholders are a little more out of luck and bought it at a higher price than should have been paid. Fantastic. So this is the single most important consideration um, when raising funds. And that is, you know, as the company grows, what's going to happen with new rounds of financing? None of your investors are going to want to be diluted. Um, and so dilution clauses are the single most important tool for VCs who want to ensure that with any subsequent financing, um, at the very least, they're not gonna be diluted to a price you know, that's lower than what they paid in a prior round. Um, and so these, these three provisions that we've included on the slide um, really are getting to how we can calculate the conversion price in an event that the future share price um, is dilutive to investors of the preferred round. Um, and so that probably sounded like gobbledygook. So I'm gonna try to explain um, using, uh, you know, real life numbers, right? And so let's just assume that we have a series A financing, right? And then at some point there will be a series B. But series A um, was the first. So let's assume that for the series A, the company issued the series A preferred at $5 per share. So typically, if there was an IPO, um, the shares would convert into common and the holders would get one share of common for one share of preferred A uh, stock. With the full ratchet, and this is what, you know, investors love, but you have to be really careful for, you know, if you are an employee or a founder, um, it provides that, you know, if there are any additional shares of preferred that are issued at a lower price than the $5, right, that the Series A investor paid, right, in the Series A round, it provides that the series A preferred shares are going to be adjusted such that when the series A holders convert, they're going to get as many shares of common stock as if they had originally purchased for series A preferred shares at the same lower price paid for at the subsequent round. So 
what does that actually mean in numbers? Um, so, you know, the Series A, we said that the company sold the shares at $5, right? Let's say for the Series B, it's a down round. Down round means that the valuation went down. Let's say the Series B preferred was issued at $2.50 per share, right? So half of the $5. The full ratchet in the investor favorable provision is go basically going to adjust the conversion rate for the Series A preferred shares from $5 to $2.50. And so what this basically allows the Series A holders to do is to convert their shares into two shares of common stock. Whereas the Series B preferred holders, even though they paid $2.50, they're only gonna be entitled to receive one share of common stock for each share of Series B preferred. And what this full ratchet is doing is protecting the Series A preferred shareholders from dilution. And they're really, really concerned about that because if they didn't have that protection, they would have been really diluted. Um, and so that, you know, if it happens one time, you know, you have one down round, maybe it's okay. Um, but if it happens, you know, several times, this is when you, you know, you see in the news or you see sometimes on these like um, law articles reference to a kind of a, a death spiral. And that's basically, you know, if there are subsequent down rounds, basically management, the founder, their share is getting squeezed down to the percentage where they don't really own anything in the company. And you might say, well, why does that even matter? right? Like we're the investors we put in the money. But if you're an investor, you, you generally want the founder to have some equity in the business, right? They need to have some stake. Um, they need to have some stake uh, so that they actually can, you know, care and that they're, they are incentivized accordingly. I think I saw a question. Yeah, that's a good question. Whether it applies when, uh, if you just decide to keep it as preferred stock. I mean, the reason we think about it in terms of conversion to the common stock is because um, that is the point in which you would be diluted. So when you are actually going to convert, you wanna make sure that when you convert your, your shares, um, you don't suddenly have less than compared to, you know, an investor from a later financing round. Uh, Alexis, can I can I just try something here on on what this what you just said, because it's a it's a sophisticated point. Uh, it's discussed in the book on page five ninety five, the ratchet anti dilution dilution adjustment. Uh, I'm going to see if I can capture it because I'm 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 having a little trouble understanding the economics uh, myself. Um, but let's assume let's assume that when we did the first round, we valued the company at uh, two million dollars, and when we do the second round, we value the company at $3 million. In order for the initial investment, well, no, the, in, the initial investment in that case is going to be, is going to have to, is gonna be less than, is gonna be worth less than $2 million. It's got to be ratcheted down because otherwise you aren't going to be able to bring in a new investor at uh, with, the, with the appropriate percentage. So that, so that the, I can't work it out of my head, but um, well, well, let me just, let me just do it this way. Suppose the new investor is coming in for one third of the company or one, say one half of the company. So, so originally the investors put in, uh, the original investors financed the company at 2 million. The company is now worth 3 million. Um, 
but the new investors are demanding 50% of the stock. In that case, there's going to be a ratcheting down of the new of the old investor shares, the original investor shares, from a value of two million to a value of uh, of one one point five. One point five. Mm -hmm. Do I have that? Do I, I, I realize I'm sort of garbled here because I'm having trouble understanding the concepts, but I just want to see whether I'm whether I'm moving in the right direction. Yep, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, so we're talking about redemption rights now. And remember, we're talking about the rights specifically of stockholders. Um, so redemption rights, they may be issued to venture capital preferred stock. So the preferred stockholders, those are the people who can get redemption rights. Um, they fall within a company's category of distribution to shareholders and a balance sheet can prohibit distribution um, and surplus includes the amount of net assets the corporation has in excess of its capital. Thanks Alexis. Um, so redemption clauses are one ways for VCs to basically ensure that the companies they invest in don't become lifestyle businesses. And lifestyle businesses can be great, right? Like these are the businesses that throw off enough cash where the founder and the employees can have a comfortable life. But as we discussed, because of the VC's portfolio, you know, they need knockout returns. And what they don't want to do is, you know, stay invested in a company that's not going to have an exit or not going to raise additional funds so that they can, you know, exit their position and generate a return. Um, and this is again tied to the fact that, that VC funds are limited, they are finite in their life. So a fund's you know, horizon might be somewhere from four to eight years, let's call it. And so they'll wanna make sure that um, you know, they're able to return capital to their limited partners um, at some point. Um, so the redemption provisions are essentially putting a finite number of years on the life of an investment by assuming that the investment is going to generate a return. So if you look at the language on the slide, um, the investor favorable provision requires redemption relatively quickly, right? I think here it says, you know, the, the third anniversary of closing, the company is gonna redeem one third of the outstanding series. And then we have another redemption event at the fifth anniversary and then another one at the sixth anniversary. Um, clauses that are kind of more middle of the road, you'll see that um, it is beginning on the fifth anniversary. So you have, you have some more time. Um, and then the company favorable approach is, is none. It's actually, we don't ever have to give you back your money because why would we wanna do that if you don't have to? Um, the one thing I would note is that the invest the investor favorable provision, which starts at the third anniversary, I, I think that's a bit aggressive. Um, you might see it in a seed stage, right, or an early financing stage. Um, or sorry, you, you wouldn't see it. Um, but it makes more sense uh, for a, a later stage deal um, where there's a liquidity event kind of closer on the horizon, like a big sale or an IPO. Typically, um, I think you see uh, the middle of the road um, with three equal installments. You know, uh, Antonia, I would think that if I were investing in uh, preferred stock in, in, in one of these uh, venture-backed firms, that I would, I would not want to get my preferred stock redeemed too quickly because um, uh, it, it might put a cash constraint on the company that would limit its ability to uh, hit a home run. And I'm going in this thing for a home run. Why in the heck am I going to insist on getting paid uh, real quickly rather than letting the thing ride and possibly having a huge payday? Exactly. And I think that's why you see the more aggressive approach in later stage deals, right? Because in later stage deals, you're closer to an exit. 
and the company is going to, you know, have a better sense of managing its financial position, wherein, you know, it probably could, if it, if it needed to, redeem the stock. Um, but you're right, like, you know, an investor wouldn't necessarily want to do this. This is kind of a, just in case you're thinking about not doing a sale or some sort of liquidation event where I might otherwise get a return, here's my, here's my out. Okay, so another set of rights that venture capitalists can get when investing and um, getting shares in preferred stocks uh, is voting rights. A class may be given full, limited, or no voting rights. So pretty much anything. I know that covers all of the above. Um, preferred stock almost always has broad voting rights and typically a special set of rights. And these would be set out in the charter. Preferred stock votes with the common stock on an as converted basis on anything that may be presented to the stockholders for their approval. So earlier we described conversion rights and a vote of that specific class. This is what we're talking about. They may or may not have the right to vote in those decisions. And common stock has a general right to vote. So they get a broad general right to vote, whereas preferred stockholders may have more specific rights and more input allowed. Thanks, Alexis. Um, so I think, you know, you basically covered it. The only thing that I would add is that sometimes, or a lot of the times actually, preferred investors are going to want extra protection, right? Um, so even though the preferred shares are generally treated equally with the common, it's going to be important to remember that there are certain provisions that allow the preferred investors to have powers that don't require the vote of all shareholders. Um, you know, one of them is going to pertain to significant events that can affect the course of the company's business. Um, those sorts of significant events um, can't transpire without the approval of that series of preferred. So, you know, those significant events, you know, could include a merger, a reorganization, a sale, amendments to the company's certificate of incorporation, amendments to the bylaws, increasing the number of directors on the board, increasing the authorized share count. Kind of, you know, think of big fundamental decisions where a preferred investor is going to want to have more of a say. Um, so, you know, I, while I would say, you know, voting rights are important to preferred holders, their, their level of influence is supplemented by these kind of additional powers that preferred investors have. Uh, Antonia, I, I have, uh, I, I'm, I grew up as a tax lawyer and I consider myself as a tax lawyer, even though I love to do, teach mergers and acquisitions, I, I still consider myself to be fundamentally a tax lawyer. And so I have a tax question for you. <laughs> I am not a tax attorney. <laughs> but. <laughs> but but it, it, it's, it's a business side of the tax question. If, if, if we could, the, the, the dividends on the paid on preferred stock are not, not tax deductible. Um, so the company pays the dividends out of their after tax income. And this preferred stock, um, is it, is it possible to structure it so that it so that it becomes a convertible debt, for example, uh, a subordinated convertible debt that looks and acts and smells like the preferred stock, but where the company is going to get a tax deduction if and when it pays um, interest on the um, the convertible debt, as opposed to paying dividends on the preferred stock? Welcome, Sebastian. I joined just in time for these tax questions. <laughs> I was able to hear, sorry, a, a good bit of it. I was in the panelist, sorry, not in the panelist section, but the observer taking it all in. So uh, this, is, this has been great. But hello, everyone. Let me not interrupt on the tax issue. <laughs> or actually, let me interrupt on the tax issue. <laughs> but forgive me, I was in a, a board meeting that went long um, because the directors were being highly engaged directors of this public company, asking questions, wanting to understand the issues. 
Um, but uh, yeah, for, forgive me for um, not being here for the the outset of the of the discussion here. Uh, Alexis, why don't you introduce Sebastian? I was just about to suggest that. So this is Sebastian Niles, who is one of the partners at Watchel. Uh, watch a Lipton Rosin and Cat. That's a mouthful. Do not try saying that five times fast. Um, he got two BSs and a BA at the University of Maryland. He got his JD at Harvard Law, and he is working on business deals worldwide and cross industry. Also, Chambers USA recognized him as one of the top three leading attorneys for corporate and M&A takeover um, decisions. So he's definitely a prominent attorney and we are very lucky to have him here. Thank you, Alexis, and thank you, uh, Sebastian. So to my tax question, Antonia, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I personally haven't worked on a convert for, for a startup, but I do know that, you know, sometimes you see that at the earlier stage. But I, I mean, I think it's, you know, people tend to want to do that less because I think of the tax reason, but more because they think of it as a, as literally like a cheaper way to, to raise funds. Um, I guess there are kind of two features that are important, which is the discount. Um, that's going to reward early investors for taking, you know, a, a, a bigger risk than the Series A um, preferred. And then I think a lot of these converts have, um, you know, a, a cap, right? And that cap is basically going to say the maximum value um, of the company when the Series A closes. And that's, again, important for the for early investors because they're going to benefit from that. So, Sebastian, I don't know if you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's driven by tax, but I do think that you tend to see converts at the earlier rounds and then you see the more traditional um, preferred stock financing as the company grows. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, you know, part of it goes to this issue of the life cycle of the company. Uh, some companies, the reason they're seeking venture capital uh, investment, depending on the maturity of it, Maybe they're not able to get, uh, for various reasons, kind of traditional uh, kind of loans or other things from, you know, from banks. Um, and then you're looking to find these more bespoke capital sources. But then even with a bespoke capital source, it could be structured as a convertible, um, you know, debt or pure debt, you know, the like. One item that you may have uh, touched on a little bit, but when we think about this concept of dividends, when thinking of venture capital backed companies, I, I like to put, I guess the term is scare quotes, but that's not really right, but quotes around the term dividend because most venture backed companies are not actually paying dividends. And the reason for that, right, is the, you know, to the extent the enterprise has excess cash flow to forge it can allocate capital for companies that are essentially emerging growth, it doesn't really make sense to allocate this cash flow to deem it excess and just put it as an ordinary course dividend out to the investors the way a mature publicly traded company that has very steady cash flows, maybe doesn't have all that many opportunities or other opportunities for growth, will just pay a regular quarterly dividend out. For at this level, one would hope and think Again, if there is cash available, whether it's generated from operations or coming for other reasons, that cash, the highest and best use of it for a company, for companies in the context that we're talking about, should be to reinvest in the business, right? Not pay it out, you know, back to the investors. But the reason why we have these dividend concepts and why I put quotes around them, particularly in the venture back, is because of how it gets triggered in the context of certain events or exits or other moments where it's almost as if, well, let's pretend as if a dividend had been paid or been accumulating. And then now that we have various monetization events, let's deem the dividend to at that point to be uh, payable, if that makes, if that makes sense. So it's, it's all sort of a legal point, but it's more of kind of a practical one. 
of the extent to which dividends are in fact the same kind of dividend that you think of for um, mature, you know, sort of, uh, you know, operating companies that have been running around for a long time. Okay. Uh, do, do you guys want to keep rolling or do you want to take a little break? Antonio, why don't, I, why don't we take a six minute break? It's 5.09. Why don't we get started right at 5.15? Or do you want to just keep rolling? That sounds good. Why don't we take a couple minutes right now? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So making a shift from the rights we've been covering, like redemption rights and voting rights, we're shifting to letters of intent, which is one of the documents that is needed, similar to the charter. It's also known as memorandum of understanding or term sheet. Um, in a couple of slides, I refer to it as term sheet. Um, it is not binding on any party except parts that expli explicitly are noted as binding, but never is the entire letter binding. So a letter of intent in its completion is never a 100% binding document, um, but it can have binding parts in it. It's a contract that precedes and enhances negotiation. So this is kind of what you want to set out, like we learned in our contracts class. This is kind of what you want to set out talking about what you want and it helps the negotiation process go along. It's also crucial to disclaim contractual effects. So the parts that are binding, you need to make it clear like this is, this is contractual and you are obligated to this section. So we can break up the letter of intent into four classes. We have a group comprised of letters that are solely used to list contractual and business terms. So just your standard layout of what is what. And then you have a group comprised of letters that are used to lay out the ground rules. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. This is what I want, this is what you can't do. Um, a group comprised of letters of identity. I, that identify significant business terms. I think those are really important in the letter of intent because so many words and jargon in business can be construed in different ways. And then it's left up to the courts later on to decide what definition is what. So you really wanna lay those out letter by letter. And then a group comprised of letters of intent that have failed. Okay, so a continuation. Exclusivity, the owner does not actively participate in the market, privately solicit, encourage inquiry, respond to proposals, discuss proposals, analyze proposals, retain proposals, or even receive proposals. So when they're discussing the letter of intent, you can have exclusivity and essentially negates all of those things. So an owner can prohibit a prospect from responding to a purchase agreement and instead have the prospect pass along information to prevent a flip. So if you're, you haven't signed a deal as a venture capital, the owner can invoke the right of exclusivity. Um, standards, the ground rules for negotiation determine the standards of negotiation. So that's what I was saying in the previous slide about laying out all the terms and the do's and don'ts and it's taken in good faith and best efforts. And then you have consummation. Generally, the agreements have as to terms, but no contractual agreement is binding the terms. It is in danger of being recharacterized as binding because of the way courts have determined cases. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, how if you leave things up to ambiguity, the courts will decide and that's not something you want because lately they've been deciding more and more in favor of it being contractual and binding. So while the letters of intent themselves are not fully binding, this is the document out of all the documents we will later see in the presentation that is most in danger of becoming binding due to prior cases. And then you have confidentiality and access. Owners must govern the use of information and who has ac access to it. So there's a certain level of privacy that is needed and required, and you don't want the owners to just have this information open and available to everybody. And then ambiguity and duplicity. It's used to create the semblance of an agreement, but differing interpretations of the ambiguity lead to court involvement. 
like I said earlier, you don't want to leave things up to chance and leave it more ambiguous to later decide because if things go wrong, it will not be in your favor. One point about the um, exclusivity is that Alexis, you're right. You know, most term sheets are going to include an exclusivity clause. Um, now, what happens if a founder, you know, doesn't uh, necessarily follow that, right? Um, is the VC going to go after the founder? In my experience, this hasn't happened. This actually happened twice um, when I was at one fund where we found out about a founder going and talking to other VCs. And no, we like didn't do anything about it, but it's a very small group of folks to invest. Um, and so I definitely think the, the founder's, you know, character kind of took, took a hit in that way. Um, another thing to note is that sometimes the term sheet doesn't include an exclusivity provision. And in which case a founder might want to use the term sheet, you know, to shop it around, see if she can get um, a better valuation or better, you know, potential terms from another investor. Um, generally like that, that could work. Um, I found that just in my personal experience that it was difficult when the founder did that because most of these VCs are investing um, with other funds, right? So if you get a term sheet from VCA and you go to VCB, but you know, if you've taken a look, you see that VCA and VCB speak all the time or you know, they, they've co-invested in, in other portfolio companies together, um, it's going to get back to VCA. And again, you, I just think folks should be, should be careful about that. And, and when we're thinking about our clients, like, you know, you might want to advise them to, to be careful with that one. You know, you know, um, just as an aside on this letter of intents, uh, uh, question, um, <clears throat> The probably the, the seminal case dealing with this uh, with with letters of intent and similar types of uh, instruments is the Texaco Pennzoil case, um, where the court was court found that uh, a, a Texas court indeed found that uh, Texaco had interfered with a, an an agreement that uh, Pennzoil had to uh, to acquire Getty. And just as an aside, uh, the name partner Marty Lipton uh, was involved in that uh, in that case, uh, and was representing um, the Getty Museum uh, in that in that case, which shows which is just an illustration of how Wattel is involved and has been involved and is continues to be involved in so many um, uh, important merger and acquisition cases. And in that case, interestingly, um, the lawyers who drafted the um, drafted the uh, letter of intent governing mm -hmm. Pennzoil did not have in it a uh, a provision that specifically said that this letter of intent is not binding, and the court found that it, it was binding, and as a consequence, uh, Texaco ended up being liable for significant uh, uh, a, a significant uh, significant damages have, have uh, Antonia or or Sebastian have either of you uh, um, do you have any any insights into the Texaco case yeah well let me give you a couple <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Texaco um, and I may also end up talking about a, a subsequent sort of situation so so Texaco Pennzoil, right? Both parties announced their own press releases <laughs> as to what had been agreed at the level of this sort of memorandum, right? And when there was ultimately the litigation, right? Because what happened, you, you, you had, you know, you had Pennzoil and Getty Oil had one agreement. Texaco makes a better offer. The board withdraws its proposal, says, okay, let's do the deal with Texaco. Pennzoil sues saying, hey, you intentionally interfered with my contract. So the issue is, as, as Professor mentioned, is, well, was there a binding contract, right? It was just a sort of a principle. 
and so you know just so folks right there's sort of this at the time this four part test which has evolved over over the years but you know one test is did one of the parties say explicitly i'm only bound once you know there's sort of a full further you know written agreement or not another test is well what happens if one of the parties starts to perform partially performs and then the other party who says no there's no contract actually accepted it they almost got like an unfair benefit. Third test is, well, was there enough agreed that you can really say there was a deal, the concept of essential terms? And then this other one sort of interesting of, well, is this deal important enough and complex enough that people would expect that if there's truly a meeting of the minds, you have a real proper formal um, you know, agreement. And so the court had to look at the press releases and say, you know, was there a full deal um, you know, or not? And you know, what ended up sort of uh, people were looking at, because again, there was a jury finding that said that there was a contract and then the court later on appeal, you know, reviewed it and they said, well, price was agreed. You know, here were these sort of different sort of, you know, sets of items. And there was an original jury award that was like $10 billion is the amount that has to be paid. Then the court ultimately changed it and said, well, it's actually only going to be 3 billion. Now, again, only is you know in, in, in the uh, you know I, I of the you know sort of of, of the beholder, but I, you know I think I would just say is that it's an example of um, everything's fine in these situations until you have some kind of dispute, and the role of lawyers in particular is to is to try as early as possible, you know, have explicit disclaimers of the non-binding, you know, sets of provisions. Don't let there be kind of an implied notion that uh, you know, there's a deal before everyone is fully entirely signed on the dotted line. On the other hand, don't be too cute around these sort of situations, right? Which is, um, you know, if the matter has evolved enough that you know, the other party maybe has a reasonable expectation that everything is essentially done, um, there's another principle in the law, which is you know, the, the need for a negotiator to be forthright. Right, which is you know don't try to um, you know reel people in sort of too far, thinking that you can always you know back out of it because if people are relying on what's occurring, um, you know you could have some real exposure. Uh, you know at the end of the day, you know years later, um, we were in a situation. Um, you know we actually cited cited this case uh, uh, a little bit of a you know whether you call it a hostile. Um, you know, takeover or, or not, but, but a situation where we were able to essentially, uh, as Wells Fargo, Wachovia and City, um, our client was able to get the better side of the overall kind of transaction because we cited uh, an, you know, kind of interim agreement that had been entered into, into the parties to basically say, okay, we hadn't reached a stage where the entire deal was fully signed up but we'd reached enough of a deal that the parties needed to keep working, needed to be working in good faith. And the other party that kind of jumped over had breached um, this at least good faith alignment and agreement that was in place. So it, you know, even since the Texaco Pennzoil case, you know, this issue of these interim letters of intent or MOUs, memorandums of, of understanding uh, can, can uh, at a minimum play a big role in giving each side more negotiating leverage than if they didn't exist, even if a court ultimately doesn't conclude that, um, you know, the parties had reached a complete deal, even if they didn't actually think that they, they fully had. But I suppose the, 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 main, the main point for uh, a lawyer drafting a letter of intent is to think carefully about what is binding and what is not binding and if something if, if there's no intent to be bound by the letter of intent you you need to specifically say hey this provision is is non-binding is that a fair is that a fair uh, uh a way of yeah. concluding i i think i think it is and it goes to your point that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition in fact Right, it's not because essentially is what is the real intent of the party? So some parts could be held to be binding, other parts not. And then people are looking at the conduct, right? The emails, the text messages, you know, the, the realities are supposed to govern. And that's why, you know, as you note, you need to be specific what's binding, what's not, have a point of view, 
and then stick to it. Are we good to go to the next slide or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just didn't want to rush anybody. Um, so now we're going to go over a couple of the documents, um, venture capital investment documents to be more specific. So when you're going into these investments and negotiations, you have the preferred stock purchase agreement and it acts as the controlling document that manages all the elements of a transaction. And let me just say, I'm doing a brief description of these because um, I believe you were also given the packet of the example documents in which both Sebastian and Antonia will go over. So I'm just giving a brief overview. Um, and then you have the amended and restated charter and that sets forth the rights, preferences and privileges that make up the terms of the preferred stock the venture capital investors will purchase. You've got the investors rights agreement. So all the rights we were talking about earlier like voting rights, redemption rights, so a collection of covenants provided by the company to preferred stock investors, all of that is laid out here. And then you have the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. And that sets forth agreements by major common stockholders for the benefit of the preferred, preferred stock investors and the company. And then you have the voting agreement, a statutorily authorized mechanism to bind shareholder votes. So now we'll talk about due diligence. It's the investor's obligation to adequately inform itself regarding securities, issues, and transactions. So if you're going to be a venture capitalist and invest in a company or corporation, it is your job to inform yourself on everything. Make sure you have all your ducks in a row and you know everything that you're getting into because once you sign the agreement, it's on you. Um, Investors focus their legal resources on reviewing documents and representation that may be overly comprehensive. So like I was talking about in the earlier cases, if you don't get down to the nitty gritty and it's too ambiguous, it's not gonna be in your favor. So in these negotiations, you really wanna focus your time on reviewing all of the documents. And there's two costly categories to focus on and that's ownership interests and the company's ownership of its intellectual property or other agreements that may affect the company's ability to pursue its business. Um, any intellectual property issues that the company discloses must be carefully examined. I think that's the phrase of this entire presentation, carefully examined. Every, you want to carefully examine everything. Know what you're getting into. And then we have the closing checklist. So. This really helps you get all your ducks in a row and you kind of want to start getting it together as you go. This is a helpful process management tool and precedent file of deal checklist. So these are all the agreements that you want and all the paperwork that you've gone through all in a nice pretty binder. And some of the things that you want on your checklist are compliance certificate, legal opinions, good standing certificates. Um, these are for like the company make sure the company is in good financial standing, corporate approvals, right of first refusal documents, management rights letter, stock certificates, security filings, and closing binders. You want it all together, nice and neat, so when it comes down to it, you're not missing anything that you need to comply with state law or anything that will put you at a disadvantage. You want to have this all together, neat, in one space so it is easy to look at and you are not foregoing your rights. And that's the end of my part of the presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Well, one item just before we go to um, question, Alexis, can you go back to the slide? There's just a diligence slide. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the reason here, uh, you know, it obviously focuses on you know, what are the issues that say an investor um, is focused on, but you know, I think just you know, stepping back, you know, for the for the class's benefit, <laughs> on this issue of diligence, certainly the investors looking at it, what do they need to know? But you know, the the founders or the management team also need to be doing some diligence, right? On who are these folks who are offering to provide, um, you know, kind of capital, right, with respect to this, you know, company. And so, you know, whether you're representing the company or if it's, you know, we're representing investor doing diligence, right? It's, what are the things that you need to know, right? What do you need to be 
um, you know, thinking about it. And um, part of it from the investor side is assess how organized is this, this existing company. And, and it's particularly at kind of earlier stage companies, one of the ways you can show that level of kind of seriousness is even from early on have kind of a almost ready to go data room or diligence room that just has all of the documents and just the history of this company sort of from day one with the idea it's organized in a fashion. So if anyone does come in and do diligence on whether it's any kind of transaction investment or whatnot, people aren't all scrambling to try to you know, pull that together. And that by the way, is a role that lawyers often kind of play to make sure is, is the documentation that's supposed to exist, does it exist? And is it all in a, you know, kind of proper, um, you know, uh, uh, this is in a very you know organized way because you know you're trying to figure out okay you know, what's the formation history of the company what's the business what are the regulatory issues you know kind of obvious things who's the management team what are their backgrounds what's their equity or equity plans um, you know in the company who controls the company right now right these are these issues of financing right and cap tables that we talked about who has what voting rights veto rights. Um, you know, how do you diligence, you know, all of that, how many rounds of financings have they done? Who are these people? Are they strategic investors? Is it friends and family? Is it just like financial, um, you know, sort of sets of investors? Uh, you know, who, who, what's the story with the management team, right? Is it the same set of founders? Did people get kicked out before? Were there disputes? <laughs> Did those disputes actually properly get resolved? Or there's the documentation, you know, around all that? And so, there's just a lot of this that can feel pretty common sense, um, but becomes potentially complicated uh, depending on how mature uh, and sophisticated the company you know, has been. Great. Okay, um, let's then move on. So this is the appendix that are oh, all- Can I, I'm so sorry, can I interrupt you? I think we had a question. Oh, but I, I is a good so. is a good one, and the question is: When a lawyer releases these documents to potential VCs or other investors, should they automatically have an NDA for them to sign, or is this not necessary? Um, it's it's an interesting question because I'll tell you, like as an early stage investor, you know, when I did it, we we did not sign NDAs, and that's because. Um, you know, these were early stage companies, you know, they weren't showing us anything super sophisticated um, with respect to financials or you know, a lot of the times they didn't even have real customer agreements. Um, it was very bare bones, so we didn't sign one, but yes, um, you want to make sure that you're protecting, um, you know, confidential information. So it would be a, a good thing, but I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if you get pushback at the very early stage. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a good point. And, and look, practically from the investor's point of view, they generally are happy to not sign the NDA, right? <laughs> so it becomes, I think, as implicit in this question of when on the company side do you push to say, before I give you access to anything, you know, we need, we need to have an NDA in place. And I'd also note, you know, this is a, probably a broader conversation, but the scope of NDAs can also go beyond simply keep my information confidential. Right. There may be other terms that particularly if you're running some kind of process around the financing, um, you know, do you want to have an influence into if you think you're talking to just, you know, venture capital, you know, investor A and providing him or her confidential information, not just documents, but business related information, you may say, well, I also want to make sure that that investor doesn't on its own try to get other people right, to join them in the investment and go, suddenly you're expanding it out because they say, oh, well, these are just my additional financing sources. So your NDA may also impose kind of frameworks and restrictions over who else they can bring in to be part of some, you know, investor uh, syndicate, if that's the way the particular series is likely to, uh, to unfold. You, you know, there is another question here uh, on the letters of intent that I think is an important one. Uh, the question is, are letters of intent 
bi not binding, but courts are interpreting letters of intent as binding. Um, I'm not aware of any letter of intent that has specifically said that it's not binding where a court has held that it is binding. Are you aware of any such letters, Sebastian or Antonia? Any, any such cases? So no, the reason for my pause though, and I, it's, a, it's a great question, um, looks like it's Sydney. So here's why your question is a little bit more complicated. The court is trying to determine what is the true intention of the parties, right? And the parties genuinely, or perhaps not genuinely, there's a dispute. So one's claiming this was binding. Right. And then the other party is saying is, no, it's not. So the question is, what's the truth? And as you know, with, you know, sort of our court system, there's lots of, kind of you know, considerations in that regard. So, you know, to to answer, you know, your question, you know, literally, if a letter of intent, if the parties did not intend a letter of intent to be binding and it says it's not binding and there's no other evidence that says, well, they put those words in, but everyone acted like it was entirely binding. I'm, you know, there shouldn't be any concern that a court will nevertheless kind of overrule the intent of the parties. But because you're dealing with a context where there's a dispute and someone is claiming it is binding, just because there's a particular word that says not binding, that gives you, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of protection. If it's properly drafted, you're not going to have any concern. But the issue is, is there some reason to think there was intent for a portion to be binding and then could a court or a jury uh, give credence to that perspective. Great. Okay, go ahead, please. So now we will move on to the appendix. I'm not sure if Antonia was I think the plan, uh, Sebastian, if it's okay with you, I think folks are probably interested in the economics. So maybe it would be helpful if you can, you know, give an overview of the typical VC structure, you know, how they raise money. Um, we can talk a little bit about the valuation kind of analysis. Um, I am cognizant of the time, um, but I, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, happy to do it. And I think let's, uh... You know, feel free to ask questions, um, you know, a, a, along the way. You know, I think here, let's give a little bit broader context. So in the venture capital context, the investors are thinking about what's the, the exit. And the reason is in most kind of venture backed companies, you know, high growth sort of potential companies and the like, these investors aren't going to see much liquidity potential until this concept of like the exit, um, you know, transaction. And part of the reason for that, and it goes back to the original question around or issue around like dividends, is it really true that people are paying dividends all along the way? Um, proceeds, cash flow revenues aren't going to be distributed to the investors during the course of the company's life cycle in the ordinary course. Sometimes you can have interest payments or other uh, you know, uh, you know, items along the way, but fundamentally the idea is, particularly if it's a free revenue company, <laughs> people are investing on the back of the, you know, the, the hope up, upon, the, um, you know, upon the future. And most of the time, the VC investors, unlike private equity, where private equity usually is buyout, right? It's control. The investor controls the entire company, perhaps with the group. With VC, everyone's a minority, a minority investor for the most part. People are taking minority stakes and their, you know, common term is there, right, along for the ride. And then these provisions with the charter and, you know, contractual rights and preferred, you know, redemption, all those things are about how do you protect yourself, um, you know, al along the way. What gets really complicated with this notion of valuation is again, it's not a publicly traded company where the shares are trading and you just can go to you know, finance.yahoo or wherever and see, well, what are my shares worth? 
nobody really, really uh, you know, know, knows. And it's based on different people's perspectives on forecasts and you know, potential. It's also, and I think this probably came up at the beginning, um, there can be many rounds of financing and investment along the way before this exit period. And investors who are coming in early, whether it's at this angel stage, friends and family stage, or you know, the, the common set of stages, series A, series B, series C, series D, series E. The people who are coming in earlier, right, are typically taking in more risk. The people who come in later often are more sort of sophisticated, you know, have, or have more leverage uh, in a sort of situation, but they're usually investing in a company that by that point is doing, you know, fairly well. And so a key item to keep in mind as you think about valuations and sort of life cycle on these terms is the stakeholders and investor base of these companies will have changed significantly <laughs> over the months, you know, and the years. And, you know, a, a friend of mine who does a lot of this work sometimes says that the documents of a VC investor, and I remember we, we were looking at acquiring a company that had a whole range of VC investors as sort of in, in a merger. And we used the term, we said, this is like a coalition, um, like government here when you look at all these documents, because each investor who came in along the way, they either wanted to add their own sort of special set of terms or you know, wanted to modify someone else's sort of set of terms or worried about you know, who are the ma management team and sort of the founders and you know, how, how you know, problematic will sort of issues be along the way. And so this whole issue of planning for exits and getting the incentives um, you know, right, you know, the like really got you know, ultimately uh, you know, can be, be, be somewhat um, Somewhat complicated. Um, one of the issues that comes up too is on alignment of uh, you know of 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 the of the investors uh, along the way, particularly on the notion of a sale. And so the issue that I want to raise around the concept of a um, you know of of a, of a sale com company a sales situation is. Each of the investors who come along, because they're getting preferred stock, they negotiate that they're senior to earlier investors or are junior to earlier investors, and it gets you know ultimately negotiated. And the concept of seniority or being junior is who gets the payouts before the other people get to have um, the payouts. And so you can have a situation where things aren't going so well for you know with a particular company one set of investors get more worry than other sets of invest investors because of the regular relative either valuations they came in in or this sort of seniority. And one set of investors may say, well, if I'm first in line to get paid, if there's a liquidation event, let me push for a sale of the company. You know, perhaps you, know, you could debate, is it sort of prematurely, you know, or not? And so you have one set of investors that are more protected against certain risks and so maybe more eager to get an exit early rather than say a management team or founders or others who say, let's kind of stick it out. Let's keep driving it forward um, and you know, see how it you know, ultimately plays out. And because these, these companies are not kind of publicly traded, people come in at certain sets of valuations, right? So say if someone comes in at a valuation where you could say the company implicitly prior to their investment is worth, let's just say $10 million, and there's a potential for an exit at $50 million, some of these investors could be really happy. But someone who came in at an invest, at, you know, at, at a stage where the company was arguably worth like $40 million may not be so impressed with an exit that involves um, you know, a $50 million uh, you know, set of exits. And so how these issues get you know, resolved, who has rights uh, in connection with exits, does the board of directors get to basically decide on their own? Are there special class votes uh, that each of the people who invested in a different level of series, do they have separate class votes or does everyone just vote, you know, ultimately get together, ends up impacting, um, you know, what are the actual de uh, decisions and do you have good alignment or do you end up having, um, you know, quite a lot of, uh, you know, dysfunction. And so just, you know, this slide here, pre verse, you know, post money valuation is, um, in venture capital in particular, money isn't viewed as entirely fungible. 
So what I mean by that, it isn't just a matter, matter of dollars and cents. It's that by virtue of this critical financing moment, that in and of itself, both because of the money, but because of what will be done with the money and the credibility that get, gets sort of brought to bear, the company will fundamentally be transformed, have a different value, um, you know, and you know, and the like. And so there's this huge debate over how should we value the, the company and a negotiation over do you value the company and accordingly you know, price your security before you give effect to any of the investment or after you give, you, you, you know, you, you, you give effect uh, to the investment? And where you end up ends up, ends up determining how much value uh, gets provided to the investor and what their pricing is and what's left for um, subsequent rounds. You know, along those lines, um, Sebastian, you sent me um, a Harvard Business School uh, um, case called A Method for Valuing High-Risk Long-Term Investments, the Venture Capital Method. And one of the things that they talk about in here is the valuation for at the different levels. For example, they say at for seed financing at that level, the investor is going to be looking for like an 80% rate, annual rate of return. But for startup financing, which is a little bit further down the line, the rate of return is only going to be 50 to 70%. And then for first stage financing, it drops to 40 to 60%. And then the second stage financing, the 30 to 50 percent, and then primarily bridge financing before you before you ultimately sell the company, it goes down to 20 percent or 35 percent is the return that the investor is uh, is looking for. So what what it what it's what it's saying is that um, the earlier the investment, the more risk, and and as a consequence, the higher uh, return the, the investor is going to expect, whereas uh, when you get down to the bridge financing, there's less risk, and the investor is going to, going to uh, demand um, less of a return. Is that a fair, a fair way of, of, of thinking about the different levels of investment? I, th I think it is. I think it's actually also a good way of thinking about it because these are getting negotiated, <laughs> right? You have to have a meeting of the minds because there isn't some true, right, kind of liquid market assessing what the value is. And so sometimes people will hire, say, well, let's get an appraisal. Um, and I think these issues of, of pre-money and post-money is you, you wanna be throughout very careful to know how are people defining it? And you know, when is one term used versus, uh, you know, versus, versus the other? Because to actually simplify it like even more, it's a question of what is the percentage of the company that the investors who come in a particular round end up getting after the investment? And similarly, what's the percentage of the company that's retained by everybody else? And it ends up being essentially a fraction but how you calculate that numerator denominator depends on, well, what is the pre-money or post-money valuation and what's the exact, uh, you know, exact amount? And these terms get used throughout uh, the you know, venture um, capital investment. And so you have to figure out what do these terms represent to each party and how might these terms or the calculations support a given position that you are trying to negotiate? Uh, you know, da down the line or in any given situation, because people, will, you know, people will, um, people will debate. And it's, and so it's, you know, again, uh, you know, you'll, you guys also be studying publicly traded companies where there's this notion of, hey, I've got these accounting measures, EBITDA, right? I've got free cash flow, I've got revenue, and I'm just going to add a multiple, like, well, I'm just going to do this, you know, 10 times sort of revenue. In this space, it's very much kind of negotiated, driven by market forces, and arguably, you know, speculative. But you you must have a meeting of the minds before you take people's money in this regard, or before you agree to receive uh, a venture capitalist money. 
coming back to um, one thing that Antonia uh, mentioned, and and this this is sort of it has embedded in it the um, the dilution issue, um, uh, because as in, as Antonia explained, if your valuations are going down and your new money is coming in but your valuation is going down, the old investors are going to be diluted. Uh, whereas if your valuation is going up, um, the new investors are going to be paying more for their percentage share than the old investors, which is, which is the situation that is most desirable, which would mean that the company is, the, the, the company is increasing in value. But, but I would think that that getting that allocation right is probably the most most challenging aspect of of venture capital investing to make sure that this that these successive rounds that are coming in are appropriately valued i would agree with that i and i think it's also um it's trying to think ahead to what occurs if the company ends up not doing so well. And are the right protections in place? Will the management team continue to have flexibility to raise capital in an effective way? Even if that means, you know, because whenever a new set of investors comes in, there's inherently going to be some kind of dilution, right? at least as to owner, raw ownership. And so that becomes this structure of how much flexibility do I have to negotiate with everyone Who's sort of at the table versus how much to was there excess protection essentially given to the earlier rounds such that it becomes harder to raise capital later unless you recut the prior deal struck with the the earlier investors and you know as many of you can imagine it's a lot easier to reach a deal if it's just you know two people negotiating <laughs> in these contexts particularly as you get to multiple series there's many more people who want to have a seat at the table and the negotiations occur essentially in the shadow, not only of the law, but what are the terms that were previously agreed to, perhaps when the company was either doing better or was doing worse. Interesting. Well, Sebastian and Antonia, uh, we are about two minutes before six. Uh, is there anything else that you guys want to say? And I want to, if not, I want to ask my students if they, if any of my students have any have a question for either of you, whether dealing with venture capital or anything else. Do you want me to click to the next slide, Antonia? Um, sure, I think Sebastian probably covered it, but that was a, um, this is just an example. So folks yeah. can uh, use that as a reference. So, um, Antonio uh, uh, or Sebastian, do you have anything else that you would like to um, like to say to our students? Antonio, anything? I'll, I'll say something quickly. But... I, well, nothing on the materials. Um, it really was a pleasure to join you all um, today. As I mentioned, you know, I only graduated a couple of years ago, so I certainly remember sitting in your seats, um, you know, and to the extent that you're thinking about um, corporate law or, you know, more specifically working with VCs and founders, I think it's a really interesting area. Yeah, and um, just the, the only thing I'll, I'll add is, you know, this, you know, all of these, these issues, the reason the terms get so complicated is because, <laughs> you're looking for capital from people who are going to argue they're investing in a really risky asset and a really risky business. And, um, you know, obviously people who are fortunate enough to, if you can run a business, raise a business, have a successful business without raising capital, well, probably in a pretty good <laughs> place in the world, it's not that common. Um, but just, you know, make sure you're, 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 you're well advised, regardless of which, you know, seat you, you're at. And, I'll just kind of leave you with kind of an, uh, I would think an interesting kind of provision that's evolved here. And you may have apologies, we talked about it before, but pay to play provisions, which is what if you create 
because we talked about with venture capital investing, you know, there's multiple rounds. Well, can you create provisions that will punish existing investors who don't participate in new financing rounds and or reward those who do? Because part of the thing with you know a company, a, a, you know, for a private business is you're going to need more capital to come in at various points in time. And if you kind of think ahead, the issue is, well, I'd love to get more capital from those who've already invested in me. And sometimes it's harder to get new capital if the new capital comes in and says, well, why doesn't, why doesn't it, why isn't it the case that anyone who already invested in you, why won't they invest more? Right? And so something that evolved is pay to play, which is, well, if you don't participate in the new round, maybe I'll convert your preferred, the non-participants preferred to common. Maybe I'll con convert the people who participate who already were in, I'm gonna give you new preferred with even better economic rights. So a lot of this can just get really interesting, but I'll also tell you though, it gets interesting, but none of this really goes to the issue of, do you have a successful business, right? That's gonna get good customers, right? Treat your workers fairly, and otherwise, hopefully, you know, be really scale up and have you know tremendous success. So with that, I've complicated all of your lives. Not really part of your course, <laughs> but uh, Professor, thank you for inviting Antonio and me. Yeah, no, thank Alexis, you. thank you for working with us on this. Thank, thank, and thank, thank, you. Uh, thank to you. Thank, to, thanks to Antonio. Thanks to Alexis, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, to our students. Um, and let me. Um, let me um, just uh, remind everyone that uh, this course will be available, or this session will be available on the internet to anyone who wants to see it uh, by sometime early next week. So anyway, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. And so long.